All right, in this video, we're going to continue on in our Blazor build series. And where we left off was about to get started with Entity Framework Core. So in this video, I'm going to walk through how I'm setting up Entity Framework Core for our little Blazor app that does metrics tracking. And it's kind of interesting because for me as someone who's been using C Sharp and SQL for ages now, or what feels like ages, I don't use Entity Framework. I write my own SQL queries. I've just always done it this way. And once upon a time, Entity Framework was slow. So it made sense to go write your own. But now that Entity Framework has evolved so much, it's standard in so many places, I'm falling behind. So part of going through this Blazor build series and trying to learn Blazor in public with all of you is also learning Entity Framework Core and showing you how I'm navigating that. Just a reminder to check that pinned comment for a link to my free weekly newsletter and check out any courses that I'm working on for Dome Train. All right, let's jump over to Visual Studio. The first part that I want to start looking at for Entity Framework is what I decided to go with to start. And a lot of people are either going to rely on a Microsoft SQL database, MySQL, something like that. But I just wanted to go with SQLite to get going. So if I jump over into our social reach project, if I head over to the project file, you can see that I have Entity Framework Core and Entity Framework Core for SQLite as well. So like I said, the reason I'm doing that is just to get started, keep it simple. And because Entity Framework allows us to be able to switch the database tech later, I should hopefully have no issues if I want to go change this at a later point. I shouldn't have to go rewrite my whole app, but here's what I have added in for NuGet packages. And depending on when you're watching this, there may be newer versions. So please don't feel that you have to use 8.0.1, but that's what I'm using in this video. Now, the next part that I wanted to focus on when I was going through this exercise on my own was designing what the database is going to look like. And I started with a code first approach because like I said, I'm very used to writing my own SQL queries. And that generally means that I end up going into a SQL database editor and trying to create tables and things like that directly in a SQL editor. So I decided I'm going to start with the record. And what I was thinking about is that each of the records that we're going to have in our only table for now are going to represent the different metrics that we have in our social media tracker. So we've started off with Twitter and that meant that having something like Twitter followers or your Twitter following, that would be something that we'd want to record. Cord. So that would be your platform ID would be something like Twitter. And we're going to have other plugins for other social media sites. So that platform ID will change. But I also figured that I wanted to add account ID. And this might seem a little bit weird because, you know, for most of us, we only have one Twitter account, but I was even thinking for LinkedIn, for example, I have my own personal page as well as a business page. So I may want to have the platform ID separated out from the account ID because there may be cases where there's more than one. So that's why I started to pull this out as well. I wanted to be able to track the timestamp that I was recording this data at. I'm going to keep it in UTC format, just a, a habit. I don't like having anything in local time it just feels like that could be a recipe for disaster in the future and the idea with the timestamp uh, I'm thinking that if we're going to be plotting data I want to make sure that I can have a time range that I'm working with or maybe I can say organize these data points by time like anything like that but I think without a timestamp it could potentially be hard to navigate just having a big blast of data that's dropped in because if we don't know what the different frequency or the cadence is for the jobs pulling this data from the internet it's going to be hard to figure out what's happening when, at least in my opinion. So that's the idea with the timestamp. Now, one of the last things I want to talk about on this DTO that we're dealing with is the metric name and metric value. And originally when we were looking at Twitter fetching, we decided that having followers and following was probably going to be pretty standard. But I figured on the DTO, so basically what we're going to be dealing with in the database, that maybe keeping it a little bit more generic would be helpful. And this might come back to bite us because if I just have metric name and we want to set that to followers, like technically there's nothing really enforcing right now that it has to be followers, maybe with a capital F or a lowercase f or we have subscribers or something like that. Like there's nothing enforcing the standardization. So that could make it a little bit messy, but at the same time, I figured it might be a good opportunity to keep it flexible at this point in time. 
And if, uh, as we add more plugins, we decide we want to lock it down a little bit more, then we can change it at that point. And for the metric value, I just figured an integer is probably safe. I couldn't think of anything off the top of my head where we would have fractional metrics, but uh, perhaps there's going to be a bit of an issue with these two things later on. But I didn't want to waste too much time trying to overdesign for that. Now, one of the last pieces that I want to call out in here is this social metric ID. So this is going to be the ID for this record that we'd have in the database. And I want it to be automatically incrementing because I don't want to have to think about it. I figured this was going to be one of the nice benefits of just dealing with it in Entity Framework Core. But what's interesting is that when I want to go create one of these records, so actually initializing one of them, I don't need to be able to specify the ID. And that meant that if I wanted to have it all in the constructor, technically this one gets kind of weird if it's in the constructor because I don't want to pass a value for it. But this does need to be accessible for Entity Framework to work. So I did make it a property that was going to be initialize and get only. So that's why this one's pulled out separately, just because it's going to be dealt with automatically. Next, I'm going to talk about the data context and some of the patterns that I was considering here. So depending on your experience with Entity Framework Core, you might start to look at some of this and question what I'm doing because perhaps there's better patterns that you're already aware of. Now, for me, something that I really don't like about Entity Framework and other designs in general are when we're forced to inherit from base classes. I don't like using inheritance. It really drives me nuts. It's just a personal preference. But one of the reasons that this makes me a little bit unhappy is because when we have to deal with these DB data sets here. Uh, this is the one for social metric, which is the DTO, the record type that we just looked at. So this is the table that we're going to be dealing with in Entity Framework. Now, what I don't like is that this is a settable property. When I go to use this throughout my application, I don't want this to be settable in any capacity. It's different to be able to mutate the data, but I don't want to be able to set this. This doesn't feel right to me. But the challenge is that in order for this to get initialized properly through Entity Entity framework, this needs to be settable. So what I decided to do was make an interface called iMetrics DB Context. And that was going to be something that I declared up here. And if we check it out, it's going to expose a gettable version of this DB data set, and it's going to have save changes async. And that's going to mean that we're able to technically add things or query them from this uh, DB set here. And then when we call save, we're going to commit changes to the database. There are probably going to be other things I need to include. One of them right away was having it be disposable so that when we create one of these things, we can get rid of it once we're done. Because my understanding with Entity Framework is that we don't want to have a DB context held open for a very long time. We want to open it, use it, close it, and move on. The last part here is just that this is technically going to be a SQLite implementation of this DB context. And that means later on, if I want to go move to MySQL or something else, I'll probably have a new implementation of this whole thing, but it's going to look pretty similar, probably aside from this on configuring part, because as we can see in here, it's uh, explicitly calling use SQLite. There's potentially some other better ways to do this that I'm not familiar with, where we could uh, perhaps keep this a little bit more generic and then configure it from the outside perhaps. But for now, I figured this is enough to get going and I'm going to roll with it. But that's going to bring me to the next challenge. And that's that if I want to have this iMetrics DB context used in our application, I need something that's going to be able to expose that to us. And that means that I need something that can create it. I know that there's an IDB context factory that's inside of Entity Framework that we can wire up with our dependency injection. But the challenge is that it's going to expose something that looks basically just like one of these, this whole thing, right? And it's going to mean that it has this settable DB set on it. So I wanted to make my own factory so that I could have full control which is what we're going to look at next with this metrics DB context factory. And technically this one is also a SQLite implementation of this because it only makes the SQLite version. And we can see that down here in this private method where it's technically constructing it. But the rest of the code that you're seeing on screen, if you're wondering what the heck is going on, is that I wanted to be able to ensure that when we go to create the context for the very first time that I'm guaranteeing sort of uh, just in time that I'm creating the database. So what I didn't want to do is on application startup call ensure created, uh, which we can see on line 103 here. I didn't feel like that was a time that I wanted to call it at. I mean, technically it's 
probably safe and it could simplify this class. We don't need this, uh, this lazy instance here, but the way that I wanted to try this out was as soon as you go to create a DB context for the first time, we'll call this. We're going to go ask to have this lazy instance evaluated once. We're not really using the return value, but we're creating a context and with the using block so it'll get disposed. And then we're just calling ensure created on here on line 103. So that means that every time we go to run this, it's going to try once the first time but because it's lazy it will never run it again and then of course it's just going to create an instance and return it so this class is a little bit weird but i just explained why i created it and probably as i continue on with this i'll find some better ways that are a little bit more common practice that people do this kind of thing but that's going to lead us to the next point which is wiring this up with dependency injection because i kind of hinted at the fact that it's going to be used like a singleton that's why it's doing that lazy uh, ensure create created call, but nothing enforces it to be a singleton except how we access it. So I've registered it as a singleton on our dependency injection container here. And I also provide it with this social metrics DB file name. So it's probably not how it would keep this, especially because I probably don't plan to have a SQLite database for the lifetime of this, but that's how I'm doing it for now. Okay, so at this point, what we've done is created a DB context and a DB context factory specifically for our use case here which is going to be able to track metrics for us. And when we go to use this DB context factory, the first time it's going to guarantee that the database is created. So that seems handy, but we have to go use it now. So where do we go use it? Well, based on where we left off in the previous videos, we have this fetching job. And right now it's not technically fetching anything from the internet. That part was commented out, but let's jump back over to that job and see how we can use this now. Okay, so in Quartz, I have this fetching job here, and this is kind of nasty. I'm really not a fan of this, but how we pass parameters into these things is not through the constructor. We have to use this other context object that's passed in through the execute method. And that means just like we did with the iSocial data fetcher from the previous videos, we have this merged job data map. And I'm just going to pass in the context factory now because we've just created that. So there's one more spot where we have to go actually pass this in. I'm just going to jump over to that very quickly because it's right back in our program.cs file. But we had this map that we were providing before, and I've just added the line on 69 here that's going to pass in this new object for us. So that's really the only spot we had to go alter to pass it in because I'm resolving it off of the container right here on line 58. So let's go back to the job itself. We can see that we're now asking for it off of the merged job data map that's passed in from the context. And we can still see that right here where we're not technically fetching anything from the internet, it's still commented out, but I figured it would be kind of cool to see if we can go write some stuff to the database using our new context factory. So what I'm doing is creating a new metric and you'll notice right above, I have a bunch of comments about some new questions that we have to ask. I'll come back to this in just a moment because I wanna wrap up the video with that part. But once we create a sample metric, what we can do is ask the context factory to make a new context. We're wrapping it with a using block here. So that means once we're done and this goes out of scope, it will close off, which is what we want. And then I'm asking for the social metrics table and we're going to add that metric in and await it. From there, I'm just gonna call the save changes async and await that as well. So technically once this all runs, we've got a new context, added the metric in, saved it to the database, and then disposed of the context. So we have all of the writing completed here from line 33 to 39. But that's going to bring us to this social metric part, which is a little bit interesting based on where we've left off with our previous design. And now that we have things like platform ID, account ID, the metric name and metric value, the timestamp's pretty simple. I'm just going to grab the current date time. But these other properties that we're trying to provide here, we don't really have a great way that we're getting that information based on our plugin design from before. So that means that when we're looking at this thing here, this fetching job is very generic. And you can see that I have a social data fetcher commented out here, but it's not like it's a Twitter data fetcher specifically or a LinkedIn data fetcher specifically. And that means that to provide this information for the platform ID and account ID, it's a little bit weird. Like, I don't know where we're going to get that yet. So some thoughts I had were that when we go to fetch that social stats object that we created, if I jump over to it here, you can see that we have a follower count and a following count. Those are the 
two metrics we talked about from before. But if I go back to this job, I mean, maybe what we could do is add on the platform and account ID so that anytime you're asking for that data, you're going to get told where it's coming from. Like maybe that's a good way to do it. I don't quite know yet. Maybe the social data fetcher itself could have properties on it that tell you that. But so far, I'm kind of feeling like that record that comes back might be useful. But the other weird thing is that that social stats record has two integers. One of them's nullable, and one was for followers, and one was for following. If you check this part out, I have now made the metric itself a string. So I'm not using an enum here, and if you watch my other videos on enums, you'll probably know my opinion about things that I can't guarantee are constant. I don't want to use an enum here because I already don't know what I want. So an enum's not a good fit in my opinion, but perhaps the metric name as a string is going to be something that's extensible enough, I'm not totally sure. But also maybe we only ever deal with followers and following. And maybe having a metric name and a metric value as separate things is just overkill. But right now I'm not sure. It's going to mean that I need to have some way where we can map that data. What that might mean is that when we ask the social data fetcher to get the stats, maybe it is more than one record that comes back, right? So we would go ask Twitter for the followers and the following. And if we go back to social stats over here, this record, the follower count and the following count, this instead would be made up of two different records, right? And the metric name we would put onto here and we'd populate it with the follower and the following count. So my brain is kind of headed in that direction. So I will probably end up blowing this apart and creating something new instead that basically looks a lot like the information that we have off of this social metric itself. So the fact that this exists and this is what I want to write out to the database, I am feeling like I probably want social metric or maybe not the exact same record, but something that maps very well to it coming off of fetch social stats async, this API. But I do think that I might want to have a collection of them come back because we're already seeing with something like Twitter that we would want followers and following and technically that's going to end up being two of these. So that's the direction I'm thinking of heading. So that means at this point in time, our Blazor application technically has a plugin that will go fetch Twitter data. We haven't seen it in action yet, but the code is written. We just need to have the credentials to do it. And then we have the database writing part. So we have these two opposite ends of the system and they're configured with a plugin. However, we just saw what's not done right now is wiring up these two pieces right in the middle. So how do we technically take the fetch data and remap it to the records that we want to write out? I do think that we have a potential solution here, which is just changing that fetch social stats API that we just looked at. So I'm thinking that's the direction I'll probably head in. But but I'm curious to see what you have to say. Like, is that the next step that you'd like to see with this video series? I think it would be pretty cool to prove that we can go start to fetch data and write it out, kind of see it end to end. But I'd love to hear from you about what you'd like to see next in this Blazor build series. So thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.